Again, it's a privilege to be with you, and I appreciate your faith and prayers in support of my old timbers. As I said, when you get to crowding the octogenarian level of life, you need all the support and strength that you can get. We've said something about Christ coming to Zion. We've indicated that it's maybe a gradual thing, that he will take up his residence in Zion, like he says in the Book of Mormon, and this will be in some measure the beginning of the millennium, at least for the righteous. I think if I were in Zion and the Lord were there, I could invite him in to tell us about the gospel and have him teach us like he taught the Nephites. I would think I was in heaven instead of just the millennium. So at least it may be that Christ's coming, so far as the saints are concerned, it certainly will be much sooner than the great events spoken of in relation to his coming to the world. As we view this whole picture of events and we move the prophetic picture from Zion to the New Jerusalem scene and see the interrelationship that is involved, we see why the prophet Joseph Smith talked about three great gatherings. We need to see things in that light. He says, we are the favored people that God has made choice of to bring about the latter day glory. That's what we've been talking about now for about two days, isn't it? It is left to us to see, participate in, and help to roll forward the latter day glory, the dispensation of the fullness of times, when God will gather together all things that are in heaven and all things that are upon the earth in one, when, and he identifies these three gatherings now, number one, the saints of God will be gathered in one from every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Now, where will they be gathered? Some people think the gathering of Israel is already happening. And in the sense that we're gathering Ephraim and we're gathering them to the gospel, etc., then yes. But the great mission of the gathering of Israel is still future. You have, you have to see that mission in the light of the prophetic picture. For example, as, as Ezekiel speaks of it in chapter 20, verse 33, As I live, saith the Lord God, surely with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm and with fury poured out, will I rule over you. And I will bring you out from the people, and will gather you out of the countries wherein ye are scattered, with a mighty hand, and with a stretched out arm, and with fury poured out. We haven't gotten to that condition yet in the world. He says, And I will bring you into the wilderness of the people, and there will I plead with you face to face, so they'll know and not misunderstand what he says. He adds, Like as I pleaded with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so will I plead with you, saith the Lord God. And I will cause you to pass under the rod, and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. And I will purge out from among you the rebels, and them that transgress against me. I will bring them forth out of the country wherein they sojourn. And they shall not enter into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Now that great program of gathering will be to the new Jerusalem. And in order to prepare for it, you've got to have a cleansing of this land, the cleansing of the saints, and the building of the new Jerusalem. When the new Jerusalem is built, when this, then this first great gathering that we're talking about here will get underway. It will be a gathering of all saints from all nations of the earth to America, north and south. This will be the land of the new Jerusalem. He says the saints of God will be gathered in one. Teachings of the prophet, page 231. From every nation and kindred and people and tongue, when the Jews will be gathered together into one. That's the second great gathering, the gathering of the Jewish people. And that gathering is only in its infant stages as yet. It will see the millions of Jews in all the lands of the earth finally return to their homeland. And then the third gathering, and the wicked will also be gathered together to be destroyed as spoken of by the prophets. The prophets speak of the gathering of the wicked to be destroyed. Where are the wicked gathered to be destroyed? To Jerusalem, to the great battle of Armageddon, to the abomination of desolation that will take place. When the devastation is of such magnitude, the blood will run bridle deep in the valleys in and around Jerusalem. That's the gathering of the wicked to be destroyed. So we talk about this last great era of time. Let's talk about it with a focus on Zion. Because as Isaiah said and Paul reiterated, out of Zion shall go forth the deliverer and turn ungodliness from Jacob. Then we focus from there down to us and what we're doing about it. So there are three great gatherings. The saints, and picture in mind the fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah in chapter 54, where the new Jerusalem has been established, and where he says, Break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles, and make the desolate cities of America to be inhabited. Then the gathering of the righteous. All these churches that we are building up in foreign lands, 
Nephi sees that they will gather, and the Lord will go before them. They will have the power of the Lord in their midst, and it will be the day of the Lord's power. It is spoken of over and over again in the Book of Mormon as a time when the Lord will make bare his arm in the eyes of all nations, to bring about his purposes. Note how Nephi puts it in his commentary on two chapters of Isaiah, Isaiah 48 and 49. In 1 Nephi 22.10, And I would, my brethren, that you should know that all the kindreds of the earth cannot be blessed, and the emphasis is a positive one, cannot be blessed unless he, God, shall make bare his arm in the eyes of the nations. Wherefore, the Lord God will proceed to make bare his arm in the eyes of all the nations in bringing about his covenants and his gospel unto those who are of the house of Israel. Wherefore, he will bring them again out of captivity, and they shall be gathered together to the land of their inheritance. And they shall be brought out of obscurity and out of darkness, and they shall know that the Lord is their Saviour and their Redeemer, the Mighty One of Israel. What does it mean that the Lord is going to make bare his arm in the eyes of all nations? What does that mean? Well, there is an occasion in ancient times when the Lord made bare his arm in the eyes of one nation in redeeming Israel. And that one nation was Egypt, right? And with power, revelatory manifestations, with plagues, with the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night, he brought Israel out of Egypt. Nephi sees in 1 Nephi 14 that the time will come when there will be such a polarization of things in relation to the people of God that there will be only two churches. He says two churches only in verse 10. The one is the church of the Lamb of God and the other is the church of the devil. Wherefore, whoso belongeth not to the church of the Lamb of God belongeth to that great church, which is the mother of abominations, and she is the whore of all the earth. Who is the church of the devil? It's not, an, it's not any given ecclesiastical organization. It's not some of the sectarian churches, one or the other, or the mother church. It is anyone who doesn't belong to the church of the Lamb of God and who comes out in opposition. Then he sees that the church of the Lamb is scattered upon all the face of the earth, and their numbers are few upon all the face of the earth. I beheld that the church of the Lamb, who were the saints of God, were also upon all the face of the earth, and their dominions upon the face of the earth were small, because of the wickedness of the great whore whom I saw. Then, when he sees that situation, and that situation couldn't happen in the prophetic time picture until after World War II. Why? Because prior to World War II, what happened with all the converts that we made? We brought them on over here to America, didn't we? And after World War II, what happened with President McKay? Stay where you are, gather together in the lands where you are, and organize wards and stakes. And we've continued that program and have temples built there. So we have the Church of the Lamb scattered upon all the face of the earth. Then he sees this great era of warfare against Zion. He says, and it came to pass that I beheld that the great mother of abominations did gather together multitudes upon the face of all the earth among all the nations of the Gentiles to fight against the Lamb of God. Now that's ju not just the media turning loose on us and that great era of warfare will begin with the American Gentiles making warfare, literal, actual, bloody warfare against the Latter-day Saints and then it will extend into other areas. Nephi sees then, and it came to pass that I, Nephi, beheld the power of the Lamb of God, that it descended upon the saints of the church of the Lamb, and upon the covenant people of the Lord, who were scattered upon all the face of the earth, and they were armed with righteousness and with the power of God in great glory. Now that's where the Lord bears his arm in the eyes of all nations. He will preserve and he will protect them, and it will be a sanctifying experience because they will learn to rely upon him. When they are gathered out, they will not go in haste, just like 3rd Nephi 21 says, nor will they go by flight, but they will go slowly. Why? Because they want to bring as many people as they can with them, who will, not, who will join with them. And where will they gather? They will gather to the land of America, which will be the Zion of God, the new Jerusalem having been established during this period of warfare. The great gathering of Israel then will get underway, and that's it. What will happen to the Jews? Well, they will gather also, and the time will come, and I don't say this with any negative feelings toward them, but the time will come when they will be good and glad to get out of America because of the turmoil and the chaos that we have here. They will leave this land as they will leave other lands, and they will finally gather wholly and fully and completely to the land of their inheritance. 
The great program as it relates to this dispensation is a two-generation program. Let me turn to the inspired revision of the Bible, Luke 21. Here the Saviour is talking to the Jews in his day about the destruction and then imminent destruction of the Jews. He indicates that they would be scattered throughout the world. He says in verse 19, And when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them who are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them who are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them who are in the countries return to enter into the city. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe unto them who are with child, and to them who give suck in those days. For there shall be great distress in the land, and wrath upon this people. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. That destruction that he spoke of, of Jerusalem, occurred in the year 68 to 70 AD, when the Roman armies under Titus gathered around Jerusalem and set up the siege against it, and a million Jews perished. When they became so hungry, they ate their own children. That gets to be a gory sight. The Saviour said that when you see Jerusalem encompassed with armies, then know that this desolation happens. We are told that when the Christians of that period saw those events taking place, they took off. They got out of that place. They weren't victims of the siege against Jerusalem. But then he goes on and note what he says. Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. We talked about that sometime or other earlier. It simply means that when Jerusalem is again in the power of the Jews, that the time of the Gentiles are officially over. That took place not in 1948 fully and completely. It took place in 1967. He goes on and note how the inspired version adds some further clarification. Now these things he spake unto them concerning the destruction of Jerusalem. And then his disciples asked him, saying, Master, tell us concerning thy coming. Now let's shift to the second coming. And he answered them and said, In the generation in which the times of the Gentiles shall be fulfilled, and that generation began in 1967, there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, like the sea and the waves roaring. The earth also shall be troubled and the waters of the great deep, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for the day of your redemption draweth nigh. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And he spake to them a parable, saying, Behold the fig tree and all the trees. When they now shoot forth, ye see and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. So likewise ye, when ye see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Now note this, verily I say unto you, this generation, the generation when the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled, shall not pass away until all be fulfilled. Now how many generations are there in the total program? Two. One generation we call the initial one, and it is fulfilled when the Jews return to Jerusalem. That begins officially the second generation. Speaking now of this second generation, verily I say unto you, this generation, the generation when the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled, shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. Now whether he waits until the latter part of the second generation, I don't know. Now, if you read carefully section 45, you'll find that it says the same thing. I don't want to take the time to get into that, but section 45 makes it clear that we're dealing with this same kind of prophetic picture and the same kind of clarification although the inspired revision in Luke 21 is more clear than that statement. As we see this picture, we see the prophet talking about the wicked gathered around Jerusalem. And let me turn with you to the book of Joel for one example of this. As you go through the biblical prophets, you may find many of them speaking of the gathering of the wicked to Jerusalem and of events that precede this and events that follow. In Joel, you have two chapters that are of major importance. The second chapter deals with Zion and chapter three deals with Jerusalem. And it's just about that simple. The angel Moroni, when he visited prophet, the prophet Joseph Smith in September of 1823, quoted from the second chapter of Joel. He said it hadn't been fulfilled yet, but that it would be fulfilled. Joel 2 deals with a great military power called a northern army. It's identified in verse 17 as a heathen force. And it is said to be the greatest military power that has been amassed in the history of mankind. 
and it will come to the land of Zion. It will cause great consternation so that Joel 2 starts out with, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. And then he describes this power that comes through. Then he indicates that the Lord, he says, will be jealous for his land. Verse 18, And pity his people, yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and ye shall be satisfied therewith. And I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen, but I will remove far off from you the northern army and will drive him into a land barren and desolate. Then he goes on and says, verse 28, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. Now Moroni quoted this latter portion and explained it to Joseph Smith. He said that it was on schedule to be fulfilled, that it hadn't been, but would be fulfilled. The thing I want to bring this up for is to give you the setting for these later developments that center in Jerusalem. Note, for example, what Joel says in verse 32, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, the second place, shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said. And so there is a third place, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. There are three places of deliverance. The prophet Joseph Smith one time got up and read the whole of this second chapter and then gave an interesting discourse on it. The essentials of it are recorded here in the teachings, page 70. He says, In the last days, God was to call a remnant in which was to be deliverance, as well as in Jerusalem and Zion. Now, if God should give no more revelations, where will we find Zion and this remnant? The time is near when desolation is to cover the earth and then God will have a place of deliverance in his remnant, and in Zion, and in Jerusalem. He says, Take away the Book of Mormon and the Revelations, and where is our religion? We have none, for without Zion and a place of deliverance we must fall, because the time is near when the sun will be darkened and the moon turned to blood, etc. The prophet makes it clear that the remnant is the remnant of Jacob spoken of in the Book of Mormon. And when this great northern army comes into the land of Zion and raises havoc and finally by the Lord is turned back, then the world situation will be such that there will be only three places where there is any kind of stability and safety. One is Mount Zion among the saints. The other is Jerusalem among the Jewish people. And the other is among the remnant of Jacob, who are tribally oriented and who will gather themselves together. And after America has been decimated by this northern army, they will go through among the Gentiles like a lion among the beasts of the forests and like a young lion among the flocks of sheep and none can deliver. And that fills that portion of Jesus's prophecies recorded in 3 Nephi 16 and 20 and 21. But the situation will be that there will be deliverance. Peace will be taken from the earth and there will be deliverance in three places. Those three places will be places where there will be some kind of internal stability among the people. In Mount Zion, and we know basically what that is, it will be God's work and his kingdom. In Jerusalem, it will be the Jewish people gathered together, some of them believing, but the bulk of them merely having their Jewish traditions and gathered together under those circumstances. But they will provide a place of safety and stability in a world of chaos. And then the third place will be among the remnant whom the Lord shall call. That word shall is important. It means he hasn't called them yet, but that he will. And when the time comes, he will call them and they will unite together and be a power in this land. They'll go through among the decadent Gentiles like a lion among a flock of sheep. And there will be a place of safety for them. And you have a world situation like that. That will be the world situation. I often wonder if we keep on the path of insanity that we're following and the American economy goes under and the economy of Western civilization goes under, what is the end result? Where is there any stability? Where will we have any kind of stability as Latter-day Saints? We've enjoyed the freedoms of this land for some time, at least to a degree. We've gotten kicked from one end of the nation to the other, but there wasn't a time along the way that we couldn't send missionaries out. And there wasn't a time along the way that we couldn't at least argue about liberty and say that we ought to have a little of it. When we got out here in the West, then we had a homeland in this great land with the constitution. But suppose, all that passes away into turmoil and chaos. Then where do we go? 
where do we look for safety? Where do we look for a supporting bulwark of strength and power from which we can teach the gospel? The answer is you won't find it in the world. You'll have to finally get on the stick and build Zion. And we'll do it willingly because we have to, whether we think we ought to or not. When we do, then there will be safety in Mount Zion. In the meantime, the Jews will gather to Jerusalem and they will be glad to get out of this land and its circumstances and in other lands. And they'll establish Jerusalem in a full program and they'll quit hassling about things that go on over there and they'll really build the program. I'm not saying that I'm all in favor of what the Jews are doing. The Arab people are a very beautiful and loving people and I've spent some time over there with them. It's a sad thing the way they are being treated by many by many and the pawns that are made by the powers of the nations of the earth and the issues that are there and there needs to be intelligent and righteous and proper solutions to that program how that finally works out i don't know but that's the setting for this whole thing and then there's safety in jerusalem and then having spoken about that then joel turns his prophetic focus on jerusalem and he says joel 3 1 but behold, in those days and in that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jeph Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. Now, where is the valley of Jehoshaphat? Well, if you are standing on the eastern wall of Jerusalem and the temple lot is right there, the dome of the rock is there and you look east, you'll see... You see, not too far away, about from here to the other end of the little town here of Snowflake, that kind of distance, with a big valley in between. Then you will see the Mount of Olives. That valley in between is called the Kidron Valley, and prophetically it's called the Valley of Je Jehoshaphat. So he is going to gather people to the Valley of Jehoshaphat, and this will be a very decisive kind of a thing. He says, verse 9, Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles, prepare war, Wake up the mighty men, let all the men of war draw near, let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Assemble yourselves and come, all ye heathen, and gather yourselves together round about thither. Cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Let the heathen be awakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. Then he speaks of this as a time of decision. Multitudes, multitudes in the Valley of Decision. Why is it called the Valley of Decision? Because if the Jews are overrun and destroyed, that's the end of the program. And if the Jews are sustained and the Gentiles are turned one against the other, as the Lord will do as he stands upon the Mount of Olives, and they cut each other's throats and the blood runs bridal deep, the end result will be that Jerusalem will be redeemed. That will be the end result. So this is a time of decision. So he says, multitudes, multitudes in the Valley of Decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon shall be darkened, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and, sh and utter his voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth shall shake, but the Lord will be the hope of his people, etc. So we're talking now about three great gatherings. In order to get this picture a little more in focus in relation to the Jews and Jerusalem, let me turn to the Pearl of Great Price and then section 45 and section 29 in order to get the clarifications of this Latter-day Scripture that we're placing primary focus upon. But to begin with, let me turn over here to this unit in the Pearl of Great Price that we call Smith Matthew. It used to be called Joseph Smith's Writings or Smith One. Here the Saviour is speaking to his people, sitting there on the Mount of Olives, talking to his disciples, and they want to know two basic things. Here in verse 4 they say, Tell us when these things shall be, which thou hast said concerning the destruction of the temple and the Jews. That's the first thing they want to know, this immediate thing that was facing them, that Luke 21 is talking about, we read. The second thing they said, What is a sign of thy coming and of the end of the world, or the, de or the destruction of the wicked, which is the end of the world? We want to know those two things. So the Saviour then, first of all, focuses in on the immediate scene and the coming of judgments to Jerusalem. Having treated that and and that takes up about the first 25 verses, then he turns his attention to what we call the sign of the Son of Man. He makes that the beginning of his explanation. What is the sign of the coming of the Son of Man? It's a brilliant light in the heavens. As such, people will think it's a comet. They'll think that it's a plane, and they will look upon it in fear. 
there is a statement in the historical department of the church, people quoting Joseph Smith as saying that the sign of the Son of Man would be the return of the city of Enoch. Because the sign of the Son of Man is right in those last stages that pertain to the events of the second coming, as it is made manifest, it is a brilliant light in the east. So Jesus says, verse 25, Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the light of the morning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, and covereth the whole earth, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. If you are looking for the second coming, and you want to know when it happens, what do you look for? You look, first of all, for the sign of the Son of Man. You look for that great event, and that transpiring phenomenon that will take place. As the prophet Joseph Smith explained it, it will be thought by some to be a planet, and boy, that will cause consternation, because here you will see that bright, that brilliant light in the heavens moving on in, and what do you think? Wow, we're right in the line of fire, and that ought to cause some of them to repent. It will cause a lot to commit suicide and all that, but it ought to cause some to repent. And the light of that will cover the whole earth, like the light of the sun. Not necessarily that it will come from the east, we don't know, but it will be like the light of the sun coming out of the heavens and filling the whole earth. Having expressed the sign of the Son of Man as a focal point to that which they look, then Jesus explains things leading up to that sign and its manifestation. Now I will show unto you a parable. Behold, wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. So likewise shall mine elect be gathered from the four quarters of the earth. Now we've said there are three great gatherings, the gathering of the saints to Zion, the gathering of the Jews to Jerusalem, and then in the midst of that last gathering, at the tail end of the thing, there will be a gathering of the wicked against the Jews in Jerusalem. And there they will be destroyed, not by the military powers of the Jewish people, but by the intervention of Christ as he stands upon the Mount of Olives. He says, okay, now let me give you a parable. It's kind of like the eagles gathering to the carcass. That's a rather homely illustration, but it gets the idea over. He says, And they shall hear of wars and rumours of wars. Behold, I speak for mine elect's sake, for nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. Now these are the wars future to us. This is the era of warfare that Nephi sees when the, when the nations of the Gentiles make war against Zion. And then the Lord turns them one against the other, and there will be wars of a devastating nature among them. They'll have something to do besides badgering the saints they are making war against, because the attention will be turned one toward the other. He says, Behold, I speak for mine elect's sake, for nations shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. And again, because iniquity shall abound, and the again refers back to, the previous, to a previous statement of things as they existed among the Jews prior to the destruction of the Jewish system in 68 AD. When he says in verse 10, Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. He comes back to that and puts it on a broader scale, on a world scale, and on a latter-day scale. He says, And again, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall not be overcome, the same shall be saved. Why does iniquity abound as a basis? Or why does the love of many wax cold, rather, take place as a consequence of iniquity? The answer is because when iniquity is present, the Spirit of the Lord withdraws and there is no love. There might be zeal without knowledge and there might be a lot of emotion, but there is no love except by and through the Spirit of the Lord. So the Spirit will withdraw and as a result, the love of many shall wax cold. He says, and again, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And that implies an apostasy from the Saviour's point of vantage when he was back there sitting on the Mount of Olives. An apostasy and then a restoration, a new dispensation of the gospel. And again, the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come, or the destruction of the wicked. And again shall, be, shall the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet be fulfilled. What is the abomination of desolation? It is the gathering of these forces and powers against Jerusalem. It is going to again be fulfilled. When was it fulfilled the first time? When the Roman armies gathered around Jerusalem and they took up their siege against Jerusalem and a million Jews perished. That kind of thing is going to happen again and the Jews will be overrun. The city capitulated. The Jewish people were shipped out and scattered. Likewise, that whole scenario will take place again, including the capitulation of the Jewish people as a nation. They will be overrun by heathen hordes. 
Then as the Jewish resistance finally breaks down and the two prophets who are there holding the Gentiles in abeyance by the manifestation of their powers are killed and their bodies lie in the street, then before the Gentiles go in and mop up, they'll say, let's celebrate. They'll send presents to each other and common commendatory statements. Hey, you did a great job. Boy, we really mopped those guys up. Now we're through with the Jews. This will take place for a little while. Then Christ will stand upon the Mount of Olives and this will signal not only the deliverance of the Jews, but it will signal the resurrection of the just. Among the resurrection of the just will be those two prophets whose bodies are unburied and still lying in the street. They will rise up on their feet and it will be rather be a rather interesting scene to see that one. It will throw fear and consternation in the hearts of those who see. Then as Christ stands upon the Mount of Olives, there will be a great earthquake that will divide the city of Jerusalem into three parts. The Mount of Olives will cleave asunder, part of it moving to the south and part of it to the north, and a huge valley will be created in between. And into the valley, the Jews will flee for safety. And there in the seclusion of that valley, while blood and thunder go on round about them, while the Gentiles in their fear and consternation turn one upon another and cut each other's throats and the blood runs bridle deep in the surrounding areas, there the Jews will look upon their long rejected Messiah. They will say, what are they, these wounds in your hands and your side? He will disclose himself as Jesus of Nazareth, their Lord and their God whom they crucified. Then the pain that they experience will be even greater than the pain that they've had to endure in the abomination of desolation. It'll be a pain of the soul, a pain of the heart, and they will weep every family apart, and they will confess their Christ and their God, and they will be converted as a nation. They will be baptized for the remission of their sins. Then the temple which will have been built by then will be rebuilt and refurbished, rededicated, and the blessings of the holy priesthood will be given to them. And they will officiate in the temple night and day as those ordinances are performed and carried out. As this takes place, the great program and order of things that has been built up in Zion will be transferred over there. The prophet Joseph Smith on two occasions talked of the great council of God that will be held in Jerusalem. There will be a uniting of the two poles of God's government. The Jews will have the kingdom of God established in their midst. As that takes place, there will be this great council of God and there will be a union of the two governments of the two poles of power. There will be a centralization of the power and authority of both governments in Zion, so that from the so that the statement of Isaiah will be fulfilled, that the law shall go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And the word of the Lord going forth from Jerusalem simply means that God's word as they meet together for their sacrifices and for their festivities and for their solemn assemblies and their meetings, God's word will go forth. It also means that if you want to study the scriptural words in their purity and in their origin, you're going to have to go to Jerusalem. If you want to study today the earliest records of Isaiah, where do you have to go? You have to go to Jerusalem. You have to go to the Dead Sea Scrolls, do you not? And there will be other records of that kind that will be found and unearthed, records including the writings of the apostles of the Lord. Other records will come forth in the latter day. The word of the Lord shall go forth from Jerusalem. That will be a beautiful kind of situation. As Jesus talks about that, again shall the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet be fulfilled. There will be a repeat of the scenario when the Roman armies under Titus besieged Jerusalem and it capitulated. There will be another time when that will happen. Then the Saviour says, And immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Verily I say unto you, this generation in which these things shall be shown forth shall not pass away until all I, have to, all I have told you shall be fulfilled. We have some clarifications on that picture in the Doctrine and Covenants. I'd like to turn to section 45 with you to get the picture as it is expressed there. Section 45 is an interesting revelation in that it's a re-revelation of the teachings of Jesus as he sat upon the Mount of Olives and taught his disciples. Someone made a tape recording of it. And they played that tape recorder through the spirit of revelation to Joseph Smith, and he wrote it down. That's what we've got in section 45. Now, note how he puts it. He is talking about his reasoning in favor of building the kingdom of God, and he says, verse 15, Wherefore, hearken, and I will reason with you, and I will speak unto you, and prophesy as unto men in days of old. And I will show it plainly as I showed it unto my disciples, as I stood before them in the flesh, and spake unto them, saying, 
and he is repeating for us the same instructions he gave to his disciples, saying, As ye have asked for me concerning the signs of my coming, in the day when I shall come in my glory in the clouds of heaven, to fulfill the promises that I made that I have made unto your fathers, for as ye have looked upon the long absence of your spirits from your bodies to be a bondage, I will show unto you how the day of redemption shall come, and also two things. One, how the day of redemption in the sense of resurrection shall come. And number two, also the restoration of the scattered Israel. He focuses in on those two things. He makes it clear that there is not going to be a general resurrection until these things that he's going to explain take place. Some people have the idea that Christ having broken the bands of the resurrection, they are going to kind of grind things out from that point, kind of steadily. The prophet Joseph Smith dealt with that situation with a good sister, not a member of the church, but a gal by the name of Jemima Wilkinson, who claimed that she died and went to heaven and then returned and was now ministering among the people with some kind of special calling, and she was resurrected. Bless her soul, she later died. But the prophet Joseph Smith, talking about her, says this, Jemima Wilkinson was another prophetess who figured largely in America in the last century. She stated that she was taken sick and died, and that her soul went to heaven, where it still continues. Soon after, her body was reanimated with the spirit and power of Christ, upon which she set up as a public teacher and declared that she had an immediate revelation. Now, the scriptures positively assert that Christ is the first fruit, afterwards those that are Christ's at his coming. A time point, a time reference. He says, but Jemima, according to her testimony, died and rose again before the time mentioned in the scriptures. What is he saying? That there is a time of resurrection. What is that time? It's at Christ's coming. The Savior back there in the time of his earthly ministry, sitting on the Mount of Olives, talking with them, they know that they are not going to be immediately resurrected. And how do they look at things? They look upon the long absence of their spirits from their bodies as being a bondage. So they are inquisitive and say, Lord, Tell us how we're going to be redeemed. We'd kind of like to know a little of the future. So then he says, I'll tell you of the day of your redemption and how things will be in that time. Then he proceeds to unfold the program of the latter days. Verse 18. And now you behold this temple which is in Jerusalem, which ye call the house of God. And I like the way he expressed that, which ye call the house of God. He didn't quite own it. He says, and your enemies say that this house shall never fall. But verily I say unto you, that desolation shall come upon this generation as a thief in the night, and this people shall be destroyed and scattered among all nations. And this temple which ye now see shall be thrown down, that there shall not be left one stone upon the other. And it shall come to pass that this generation of Jews shall not pass away until every desolation which I have told you concerning them shall come to pass. Ye say that ye know that the end of the world cometh, Ye say also that ye know that the heavens and the earth shall pass away, and in this ye say truly, for so it is. But these things which I have told you shall not pass away until all shall be fulfilled. And this I have told you concerning Jerusalem. And when that day shall come, shall a remnant be scattered among all nations, but they shall be gathered again. Now the scene shifts from the time of the Jews' destruction and their scattering to the latter day. But they shall be gathered again. But they shall remain until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. The times of the Gentiles mark the real gathering of Israel. Although the Jewish people themselves, many of them, come to Jerusalem beginning with the events following World War I and on up through the Balfour Declaration, on through the events, the events that led to the War of 1948, etc. Then you have the Jews gathered there. But the main gathering of the Jews will not take place, he indicates, until after the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Then he says, and in that day, the day of the times of the Gentiles, when they are fulfilled, shall be heard of wars and rumors of wars, and the whole earth shall be in commotion, and men's hearts shall fail them, and they shall say that Christ delayeth his coming until the end of the earth, and the love of men shall wax cold, and iniquity shall abound. Then he talks about our time. And when the times of the Gentiles is come in, a light shall break forth among them that sit in darkness, and it shall be the fullness of my gospel. This is going to be the light of the gospel, and he gets the restoration in there. He says, But they receive it not, for they perceive not the light, and they turn their hearts from me because of the precepts of men. And in that generation shall the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And he goes on to explain the circumstances that follow. Then he finally brings the picture down to his second coming. Let me begin with you here on verse 42. And behold, the day of the Lord shall come. The sun shall be darkened, and the moon be turned into blood and the stars fall from heaven, 
What's the reason all that happens? Someone is going to get on the moon and paint it red? No, the atmospheric condition will be such that the sun will be darkened and the moon will be turned to blood. He says, and then shall they look for me, and behold, I will come. And they shall see me in the clouds of heaven, clothed with power and great glory, with all the holy angels. And he that watches not for me shall be cut off. But before the arm of the Lord shall fall, an angel shall sound his trump. And that's the seventh angel, Michael, shall sound his trump. And the saints that have slept shall come forth to meet me in the cloud. Wherefore, if ye have slept in peace, blessed are you. For as you now behold me, and know that I am, and he is still sitting there talking with the Jews on the Mount of Olives, as you now see me and know that I am, even so shall ye come unto me, and your souls shall live, and your redemption shall be perfected, and the saints shall come forth from the four quarters of the earth. Then shall the arm of the Lord fall upon the nations. See, the arm of the Lord falls upon the nations when he stands on the Mount of Olives. And just immediately before that, immediately before that, the resurrection of the righteous takes place. Then they come forth. Then the arm of the Lord follows, and the arm of the Lord is Christ, standing upon the Mount of Olives. And this great earthquake, it's not just an earthquake, it's much bigger than that. It's a kind of a cataclysmic upheaval so that the earth will reel to and fro on its axis. He goes to say, Then shall the Lord set his foot upon this mount, and it shall cleave in twain, and the earth shall tremble, and reel to and fro, and the heavens also shall shake. In other places it indicates that the earth will reel to and fro as a drunken man. You'll see the sun come up in the morning, and by 10, it will have set somewhere down in the south or the north. By 2 in the afternoon, it'll be on over here, and it'll zigzag back and forth across the heavens. That's one sign that I think even a late sleeper ought to pick up on. The earth is reeling to and fro on its axis, and what happens to the water of the ocean? It'll heave beyond its bounds, and the cities of the nations of the earth will crumble. They'll be reduced to chaos and to rubble, and Jerusalem will be divided into three parts. The Mount of Olives will cleave asunder, and these great events will be underway. As they are, the Lord will make his appearance among the Jewish people. Let me turn with you from this point over, he goes on, and the Lord shall utter his voice, and all the ends of the earth shall hear it, and the nations of the earth shall mourn, and they that have laughed shall see their folly, and calamity shall cover the mocker, and the scorner shall be consumed, etc. But then he goes on and talks about, and maybe I'd better put this in at this point. He says, And then shall the Jews look upon me and say, What are these wounds in thine hands and in thy feet? And then shall they know that I am the Lord, for I will say unto them, These wounds are the wounds with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. I am he who was lifted up. I am Jesus that was crucified. I am the Son of God. And then shall they weep because of their iniquities. Then shall they lament because they persecuted their king. Now in section 29, we have another major contribution made in Latter-day Revelation concerning this picture. The Lord here speaks of his coming in glory, in his glory. Verse 11, I will reveal myself from heaven with power and great glory and with all the hosts thereof and dwell in righteousness with men on earth a thousand years and the wicked shall not stand. And again, verily, verily, I say unto you that it hath gone forth in a firm decree by the will of the Father that mine apostles the twelve which were with me in my ministry at Jerusalem, and I expect that excludes Judas and includes Matthias, shall stand at my right hand at the day of my coming in a pillar of fire, being clothed with robes of righteousness, with crowns upon their heads, in glory even as I am, to judge the whole house of Israel, even as many as have loved me and kept my commandments, and none else. Then coming back to this trump that sounds, the trump of Michael, the seventh angel, he says, verse 13, for a trump shall sound both long and loud, even as upon Mount Sinai. So he gives us an illustration of how it, would, how it will be. If you will turn back to Exodus 19, you will pick up the picture there of what he is talking about. A trump sounding long and loud, even as upon Mount Sinai. Chapter 19, verse 19. It talks about the great event when Moses brought Israel out of her camp to Mount Sinai to meet with the Lord. In verse 18 it says, And Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice. Now that's what I call the first great fireside that was ever held among the people of the Lord, when they met with the Lord on the smoking of Mount Sinai. But aside from the trivia statement there, which I will repent of quietly, 
and carefully and rapidly, it gives us an insight as to the events of Christ's second coming. He says, For a trump shall sound both long and loud, even as upon Mount Sinai, and all the earth shall quake, and they shall come forth, yea, even the dead which died in me, to receive a crown of righteousness, and to be clothed upon, even as I am, to be with me, that we may be one. But behold, I say unto you that before this great day, before he comes and the resurrection, he steps back in time. But before this great day shall come, the sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall be turned into blood, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and there shall be greater signs in heaven above and in the earth beneath, and there shall be weeping and wailing amongst the hosts of men, and there shall be a great hailstorm sent forth to destroy the crops of the earth. Now that hailstorm is an event that takes place immediately before Christ comes to the Jewish people. It's not really a part, at least this one isn't, it's not really a part of the situation that leads up to the cleansing of Zion as sometimes we are led to believe. And it shall come to pass, because of the wickedness of the world, that I will take vengeance upon the wicked, for they will not repent. For the cup of mine indignation is full, for behold, my blood shall not cleanse them if they hear me not. Wherefore, I, the Lord God, will send forth flies upon the face of the earth, which shall take hold of the inhabitants thereof, and shall eat their flesh, and shall cause maggots to come in upon them. This is a good after-dinner speech if you want to give a real one. He says, And their tongues shall be stayed, that they shall not utter against me, and their flesh shall fall from off their bones, and their eyes from their sockets. And it shall come to pass that the beasts of the forest and the fowls of the air shall devour them up and the great and abominable church. And this is when the heathen and the Gentile forces, including the great and abominable church, gather against Jerusalem. And the great and abominable church, which is the whore of all the earth, shall be cast down by devouring fire, according as it is spoken by the mouth of Ezekiel the prophet, who spoke of these things. So we see this general picture, and let me just kind of fit it in, in the time we've got left, and bring it on into the millennial period. We see in the prophetic picture the establishment of Zion. We see Christ coming to his temple to make kings and priests of those who have been prepared for that final act of placing the capstone on the house of Israel in their gathering to Zion. And then we see the great council at Adam on Diamon, where the final preparations are made for the second coming and the judgment is set. The judgment is set means that they've set the program out. Okay, you're supposed to do this and you're supposed to do that. And you, angel, you do that and you do this because now we've got to go to Jerusalem. And then when they, when they go to Jerusalem, Christ stands upon the Mount of Olives, and just immediately before, almost as he does, the resurrection of the righteous takes place. The Mount of Olives cleaves asunder, and this isn't just a simple earthquake. This is a cataclysmic upheaval, upheaval of such magnitude that the earth wobbles and reels and is actually knocked out of its orbit. It's like a lost sheep running here and there, Men's hearts really begin to fail them. They wonder where they are going. They are on a wild travel through space and their hearts fail them and they fall down. Then they think this brilliant light in the heavens, the sign of the son of man, they think they are going to be bombarded from that source. In the midst of all this, you see the Jewish people converted as a nation and the order of the kingdom of God, which the latter day saints have built up in Zion is transferred over there. And the economic order of Zion is established among the Jews. And it will kind of help the reputation of the Jews to have that order established among them, if they'll practice it. Then the government of God will be set up among the Jews, and a nation will be born in a day and the ordinances of the temple, administered. And they will be brought into the church of the firstborn. And all things will be prepared so that in a few months' time, after Christ stands upon the Mount of Olives, this great event of his coming in glory in the clouds of heaven will occur. This, as I've said, will be preceded by the resurrection of the righteous, and they will come with him. One of the clarifications that Moroni made in the great Malachi prophecy, that the earth would be burned as stubble, is that they come, not just Christ, that they come shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, and this will be a renewal of the earth. Over in section 101, beginning with verse 23, and we'll try to get the, through this before we conclude this evening. You have the Lord's statement concerning the renewal of the earth. We have in Article of Faith 11 the statement, We believe not only in the gathering of Israel and the restoration of the ten tribes, that Zion will be built upon this, the American continent, and that the earth shall be renewed and receive its paradisiacal glory. It's going to be brought back to a position somewhat comparable to that which it enjoyed before the fall, when the veil is taken off and the glory and power of God is made manifest. 
The Lord, here in section 101, verse 23, invites us to consider these things and explain some of the events related to them. He says, Prepare for the revelation which is to come, and when the veil of the covering of my temple in my tabernacle, which hideth the earth, shall be taken off, and all flesh shall see me together, and every corruptible thing, both of man, or of the beasts of the field, or of the fowls of the heavens, or of the fish of the sea, that dwells upon all the face of the earth, shall be consumed. How will they be consumed? They will be consumed by the glory of the Lord, so brilliant in its power and its manifestation, that they will literally go up in smoke. The mountains will flow down at his presence, and the waters will boil. Can you imagine the glory of a person, namely the glorified Christ, of such intensity that when the veil is taken off, the whole earth is literally cleansed? What kind of being is Christ? He is a glorified being. And let me suggest to you that when they are burned, they won't be burned like a blowtorch burning on their skin outside. They'll be burned from within. Why? Because the manifestation of his glory, of his intelligence and his truth and light is in such concentration that it is, a, is foreign to corruption. And that corruption isn't just on the skin, it's on the inside. And you begin to burn from within because of the corruption within your soul. The wicked will be as stubble. So he says then, that every corruptible thing, both of man or of the beasts of the field or of the fowls of the heavens or of the fish of the sea, that dwells upon all the face of the earth shall be consumed, and also that of element shall melt with fervent heat, and all things shall become new. Now this isn't just a scorching fire. All things shall become new. There is a cleansing. There is a burning by the power of his glory, because that which is corrupt cannot stand it. But then there is a renewing of that which remains. There is a quickening of life. There is an infusion of light and truth and living powers within all things, and the earth is raised back to a state of paradisical glory. He says, And all things shall become new, that my knowledge and glory may dwell upon all the earth. There is a reason why he renews the earth, so that it will be compatible with the manifestation of his glory. When we use the words of the scriptural passage, which says that the knowledge of God will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea, we're not talking about theological knowledge. We're talking about revelatory knowledge. We're talking about knowledge through the Spirit, because the earth has been cleansed and renewed and elevated. His knowledge and glory shall dwell upon all the face of the earth, and the knowledge of God will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. That power and that light and that truth and that knowledge of righteousness and of truth will transform those who remain, including the animal kingdom. It goes on to say, and in that day the enmity of man and the enmity of beasts, yea, the enmity of all flesh, shall cease from before my face, and the lamb will literally lie down with the lion, and the child will literally put his hand in the cockatrice's den, which is a deadly serpent. And these things will be literal by reason of the transformations that take place. Some people read Isaiah 11 and other places where he expresses these things, and they say, well, that's the dreams of an old white-haired man. Well, I'm an old white-haired man, and I dream too. But those things will be literal, just as literal as you can write them. He goes on to say, And in that day, whatsoever a man shall ask, it shall be given unto him. Read Isaiah 65, 24, and you'll find that Isaiah says that even before they ask. You just start thinking about it, and the purity of the of heart of people and the revelatory union between man and God will be such that the Lord will answer you even before you ask. Whatsoever any man shall ask, it shall be given unto him. And in that day, Satan shall not have power to tempt any man. And the reason he cannot have power is because you destroy the basis of operation. Satan operates within the flesh and the corruption within the flesh. Read, for example, 2 Nephi 2, where Lehi is talking about the great alternatives of righteousness that confront us. And he says, verse 29, choose eternal life according to the will of the Holy Spirit and not choose eternal death according to the spirit and power of the devil brings you down to captivity. Let's go back to verse 29 and not choose eternal death according to the will of the flesh. I knew it was that verse and the evil which is therein. Now, where is the their evil in the human organism? Not just in the spirit, but primarily in the, fl in the flesh, right? When the earth is renewed and there will be a cleansing, a sanctifying of the righteous and the base of operation of old scratch will be destroyed and he won't have power by reason of the renewal of the earth. It says in that day, Satan shall have no power to tempt any man. 
and there shall be no sorrow because there is no death. Not in the sense that you don't make the transition from mortality, but no death in the sense that the corruption that brings the process of deterioration into operation will be checked by reason of the renewal of all life. You will have 90-year-old football players with huge muscles and powers and prowess and ability and skill. You'll have 90-year-old beauty queens, curvaceous and lovely and beautiful. Let me suggest, brethren, that you get yourselves worthy of them. And there will be a renewal of life. There shall be no sorrow because there is no death. In that day, he clarifies it, an infant shall not die until he is old, and his life shall be as the age of a tree, and when he dies, he shall not sleep, that is to say, in the earth, but shall be changed in the twinkling of an eye, and shall be caught up, and his rest shall be glorious. The Lord goes on to say, Yea, verily I say unto you, that, say unto you in that day, when the Lord shall come, he shall reveal all things. That will be a beautiful time, he says. Things which have passed and hidden things which no man knew, things of the earth by which it was made, and the purpose and the end thereof, things most precious, things that are above and things that are beneath, things that are in the earth and upon the earth and in heaven, and all they who suffer persecution for my name and endure in faith, though they are called to lay down their lives for my sake, yet shall they partake of all this glory. Now that's a marvellous hope. The earth will be renewed, brought back to its paradisical state. It'll have two great poles of power, Jerusalem and the New Jerusalem, the Order of Zion, the economic order of consecration. All things will be centered in Christ. The political kingdom will be extended, having been initiated by the Latter-day Saints in the Rocky Mountains in its incipient or beginning forms, and then extended to the New Jerusalem. And then, when the Jews are redeemed, extended over there. Then, as the book of Daniel tells you, and I don't have time to get into it, the heathen nations will give up their dominion, and they will submit to the kingdom of God politically. God's kingdom will cover the earth before the church and the gospel covers it spiritually. And then as that program is ushered in and established, the gospel is taught in great power. And then you have the great conversion of the masses of humanity to the gospel. Those who do not convert as the Lord said through the Book of Mormon and also Old Testament prophets, they will be judged and destroyed and you will finally have the law. That's the general picture. While it may be interesting, my brothers and sisters, in a curiosity way and in an academic way, let me just bring it home to us again. This is the ball game we're playing. We haven't gotten to the ninth inning yet, but this is the ball game that we're playing. And we are at the batter's plate. The building of Zion depends upon you and depends upon me. It depends upon us listening to a prophet and getting our houses in order and cleansing the inner vessel. It depends on getting to the Book of Mormon and understanding what it is and making it a daily diet in our lives. It depends upon getting in tune with the living prophet and our bishops and our state presidencies. It depends on these things. The end result is putting away this crud and corruption that we see inundating America and inundating our children and our families. And finally, putting a stop to that and cleansing things and getting Zion raised as an ensign and finally the cleansing of the earth and the renewing of the whole earth to a paradisical state of glory and righteousness and peace, is that worth working for? I want to bear you my testimony that these things are true, that we're involved in this great work and that the Lord is directing it and we've got a living prophet who is giving us more than we believe and more than we practice already. May the Lord bless us to further this work and to help it along, I pray humbly in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Questions and Answers Question. When Christ comes and lives in the city of Zion, will we recognize him as Jesus Christ? Answer. Absolutely. You bet. He's not going to come to his own and not be recognized this time. Question. Is it true that some saints may take part in the war at Armageddon, and if so, why? Answer. I want to talk about this tomorrow night. I mean, I want to talk about the harvest season, and we'll get into the details on this. I can't quite answer that now, because we just don't have quite the background. But we'll get the general picture of it tomorrow night. Then if you'll resubmit the question in the light of what we may not cover, I'll be happy to respond to it. Question. How will the earth reeling to and fro from when, when Christ appears on the Mount of Olives affect America? You know, was it Wilford Woodruff who was up in Logan and he kind of postulated the situation of the future of his day? He talked about New York sinking into the depths. He talked about Albany being destroyed and other eastern cities. I don't know quite when that's going to take place, but it is part of the prophetic literature of the Latter-day Saints. When the seas heave beyond their bounds, you know, 
years and years ago they had an earthquake up here at some lake have you ever heard of that one up this side of west yellowstone it reached on down into the rexburg area we went up to see what happened there was a lake up there and when that earthquake hit it the waters of the lake went just like lifting up a bathtub the one end of it about two feet and then letting it drop the waters go boom that's what is going to happen with the ocean the Lord says, if I can just leave you with this comment in section 133, that when these things take place, then there's going to be a whole reorientation of the earth's surface. It says, verse 20, 23, he shall command the great deep and it shall be driven back into the north countries and the islands shall become one land and the land of Jerusalem and the land of Zion shall be turned back into their own place and the earth shall be like as it was in the days before it was divided back in the days of Peleg before the flood. And the Lord, even the Saviour, shall stand in the midst of his people and shall reign over all flesh. Now these great cataclysmic upheavals in reshifting the earth's surface will take place. And that's what's going to cause the earth to reel to and fro. That in connection with a lot of other things. Let me turn to 3 Nephi 26 with you for just a minute. We might have time to just get a few of these things. Here Jesus is talking to the Nephites and began to unfold the prophetic picture clear on down to his second coming. Note what the record says, very brief but succinct. And now it came to pass that when Jesus had told these things, he expounded them unto the multitude, and he did expound all things unto them, both great and small. And he saith, These scriptures which ye had not with you, the Father commanded that I should give unto you, for it was wisdom in him that they should be given unto future generations. And he did expound all things, even from the beginning until the time that he should come in his glory. Now wouldn't that have been a marvellous thing to listen to? In on, he says, Yea, even all things which should come upon the face of the earth, even until the elements should melt with fervent heat, and that's when the veil is opened, and the earth should be wrapped together as a scroll, and the heavens and the earth should pass away. Now that's the present heavens and the present atmospheric earth. To wrap the earth together as a scroll, you have a symbol of a scroll. I was in Samaria and saw the oldest Samaritan scroll in existence. It had the rod down here that you could wrap the scroll on and over here and you wrap that thing together. As you wrap it together then, what happens if you wrap the elements together? What happens to the water? It's driven back into the north countries. Then when you finally get to the, get the two ends of the scrolls right in together here, then you wrap one of them on through to where you get them all finally on one stick. The Lord uses that as a symbol of what he's going to do with the earth. The earth is not only going to be renewed and brought back spiritually, it's going to be restored to the geographical position that it was in and the relationship it was in before the fall and before the flood. It's going to be brought back. And these great events are going to cause the sea not, to ju not just to heave to and fro, but the great deep will be driven back into the north countries. The whole earth, the mass of it, will be, become one land. It will be a rather interesting and a devastating kind of thing. The earth will reel to and fro and it will shake and tremble and the cities of the nations will crumble into turmoil and chaos. And we hope that Brigham Young did a good job with the Salt Lake Temple because he said, I'm going to build it so that it will last through this stuff and on through into the millennium. I believe maybe he's going to accomplish that job. But that's going to be the situation and how it will be. Well, thanks again for your attention, and again, let me leave you my testimony that we're involved in the most important work that God has given to any people in any dispensation of time, and we're here in it, and we ought to be alive spiritually. The Lord bless us that we might do so, I humbly pray, in Jesus' name, Amen.